reduction in long-term impact is, is different to what we've seen before. So just, just look at parked aircraft because it's a decent metric. It's easy to, to monitor, plus it's in the title of our talk today. So um, if we looked at parked aircraft through, let's say, the last downturn, which would have been the financial crisis, it's actually quite interesting to go back and look at this. You, if you just looked at the parked fleet, you wouldn't think there was any crisis at all. The numbers almost didn't change for each category of aeroplane, whether you're talking turboprops or single aisle wide body regional jets. Percentage of parked fleet through the financial crisis was between 10 and 20 and never over 20%. If you look at the situation today, the parked fleet across the board in all segments is over 50% completely unprecedented. We haven't seen that before. We're, we're, we're a little bit in the middle of it, I guess, in PVP, only because we're working with airlines and leasing companies right now. So we're trying to help <coughs> manage themselves through that process as there, there will be a recovery. So that's good news. Um, in fact, it can't get much worse. So I guess there has to be a recovery in, in that sense. But what makes this event unique other than its magnitude is that it impacts all segments of the market. And there's, there's really no place to hide in effect. Everyone is in survival mode at the moment, hopefully returning to sustainability and growth in the future. But as a result of that, and now just looking at the MRO sector uh, particularly, I think uh, it, it won't act any differently to other sectors. What, what do you see when there's very significant market disruption, which is clearly what we have today, you, you see people doing strange things. And as a result of that, I would anticipate that in the coming years, and it will be years as opposed to months, that you'll see a number of significant failures as we've already started to see a little bit on the airline side. That tends to happen first, and then the other businesses tend to follow. And ultimately, I, I may anticipate that when we come out of this to whatever the new normal will be, the, the strong will have got stronger, at least in relative terms, uh, and, and some of the weaker guys will have, will have disappeared. And I think the MRO community, um, outside of the biggest ones, the sort of air, big airline owned ones, is probably not the best capitalized businesses in the world. And as a result of that, I think would also be prone to these type of material changes. F final comment is I think you'll also see people sort of getting out of their lane. So when you're in survival mode and you're trying to generate revenue from wherever you can, I think it's more likely that you begin to look across outside of your normal lane to try and generate additional revenue. And I think we'll see some of that in the future as well. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, Dave, uh, your turn. Thank you. Well, good morning, afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to kind of reinforce a little bit of what the, uh, Andy and Mike have said already um, and kind of just look at the parked fleet and impact on MRO. So trying to be a little bit controversial. Um, you know, what's going to happen to all these aeroplanes that are parked up? Are we just going to turn them into beer cans? Probably not, but will they all come back into service? What's going to happen to some of them? Will they become passenger to freighter conversions? Uh, or will we be, you know, wallowing in a sea of new serviceable material and parts? I, I think the answer is yes to all of them, but in varying degrees. I think what's different this time is we're kind of in this shock mode that we've never been in with the unprecedented numbers. I think Annie talked to, you know, the, the, the sheer numbers of aeroplanes that are currently uh, parked up and whether or not they'll ever come back into service you know, we're all toying with, and we'll, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions about that. Um, I think it's the velocity that this thing's happened um, has also shocked everybody because we've never been through a downturn like this before. Um, but everybody sees bad things coming out of this. It may actually be good in the long term, but it's going to take a while to get back there. You know, we're going to see markets pick up. Um, Planes get back flying, but it's not going to be immediate. Do you want to flick to the next slide and I'll chat a little bit about the impact directly to MRO? You know, obviously not a good time for anybody at the moment. Um, there'll be a, there's a bit of a lag from aeroplanes being parked to impact on MRO because obviously there's been some 
work in progress out there. But without doubt, you know, airlines have had to stop spending money very, very fast. And you see that in terms of the number of repairs uh, coming through shops and also the demand for spares. Because the first thing the airlines are going to do is burn down what they've currently got and then they're going to start cannibalizing what they can steal off of their parked aeroplanes. So, you know, from a supplier uh, perspective, you know, um, both MROs and OEM suppliers like ourselves um, that are looking at uh, our aftermarket sales are seeing a dramatic drop off. Uh, obviously, we're keen to see when that uh, flattening and upturn comes um, and how we can outrun and survive this thing unlike the poor dinosaurs in the picture. Um, but there will definitely be folks that fall by the wayside. Um, whether that leads to consolidation amongst the airlines themselves, or some of them just going naturally out of business. Um, on the MRO side, maybe some of the independent shops are going to be harder hit than the airline MROs, or the airline MROs may decide that they want to tighten things up and maybe not do everything themselves. I think the mom and pop shops are probably going to suffer because basically it's going to be those legacy fleets that they depend on um, that are going to wither on the vine. Um, but, you know, I think we're going to start seeing some signs of uh, return to service. Um, but I think the shape of that return to service is going to be very different in terms of the fleets that are going to return probably with the single R's and the RJ's first and the big twins that, you know, cater mainly for the um, international markets probably coming on last. So it's, it's trying to figure out um, how that is all going to weigh up. And I think the, we're going to see some very interesting new city pairs because I think single R's are going to be serving a lot longer routes and transatlantic uh, and international routes that we haven't seen before because the passenger numbers are going to be slowly incrementally building up, but they're not going to rush back. I mean, people are now forecasting we're not going to be back till what, 2023, 2024 to 2019 numbers. So in the meantime, airlines are going to manage their capacity by the shape of their fleet. And they're going to probably use their newer, more fuel efficient airplanes than all the old clunkers. And that's those that are going to go to the scrapyards and eventually get turned into the beer cans. Um, but I think all of that is going to be managed in terms of there's not going to be a huge sea of spare parts because people can't afford to spare, you know, break down airplanes. And why do they want to reduce the value of those spares in the inventory? Uh, it's not in their best interest. Probably be a fire sale in the near term to get rid of their current inventories, but in the long term, it's in best people's best interest to try and keep those prices pre pretty steady. So that, that's my kind of um, thoughts around um, where we currently are. Uh, and we're all, you know, scrapping and fighting and uh, avidly trying to pull ourselves out of this thing um, and get on the road to recovery. But, you know, signs are at least, you know, passenger numbers are slowly creeping up. Um, here in the US and in other parts of the globe, probably increasing a little bit faster. So that, that's at least encouraging. Um, so uh, that's my put on things for the moment. Back to you, Ernie. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Dave. Uh, Ernie, real quick, um, I just want to um, expound upon something that, that Dave said. Um, so everybody's done their intro, and there's a lot of doom and gloom, right? Um, everything is not the end of the world, right? And um, it's very interesting. If you go back and look at the, the uh, bankruptcy, reorganization, merger years for airlines between 2003 and 2008, and even after the Great Recession, airlines came out of that period much stronger. The industry came out of that period much stronger. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty right now about what's, what's happening both with airlines, OEMs, and MROs. Um, but one thing I'm pretty sure is what, how the, 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 the turmoil we go through in, over the next two or three years, the industry will come out much stronger. I appreciate, I appreciate that, uh, that insight. Uh, 
It appears that uh, we've had a technical glitch with uh, Addison, so he has uh, dropped off despite being the host of the conference. So now I have to learn how to do multitasking at the same time. Uh, so forgive me if there are any technical glitches that arrive while I try to uh, try to ask some more questions. But uh, the next question for the panel, unfortunately, uh, we we did share them beforehand, uh, is to. Uh, well, let's uh, let's let's address this one uh, in the other direction. We'll start with uh, start with Dave. Obviously, uh, airplanes that don't fly aren't generating maintenance requirements, and uh, we've we've grounded a, a number of aircraft types. Uh, which which ones specifically of the older of the older models do you think might be made into beer cans? Are we looking at uh, MD eighties or? I think you're definitely looking at the MD eighties. Um, they, they they're definitely gone. And there's nobody really left to consume those parts because Delta was really the last major operator. Um, so I think those ones are definitely going to get, well, those will be become beer cans because there's no, not going to be much demand for spare parts out of those. Um, I think we're going to see Delta are talking about some of their 717s, but there's still some customers out there that might want those parts um, or they might return to service. Um, I think some of the early 7.3 NGs are out of here. There'll be good demand for those parts. Um, and same for old A320s. Um, A340s, I can't see anybody wanting those, but um, especially ones with their teeny weeny CFM engines. But, you know, it provides spare parts uh, on the motor side. And then um, on the Boeing side of things the seven fours seven fives seven sixes i see those being available for um packs to freighter conversions um but some of those are probably going to go to the scrapyard this time because those have had a you know there's been a reprieve with some of the things that have happened in the market space with delays on various airplanes coming into service originally 787 and uh, now triple seven x um so, but, uh, and, and the max groundings has kept some of those aeroplanes flying perhaps a bit longer than we'd anticipated. So those are the ones I see kind of uh, disappearing off. And obviously a 380s the big one, literally, that I don't see, um, I, I don't see a lot of those necessarily coming back into service just because of how the airlines have got to manage their capacity demand. Uh, Andy, your view on the, uh, on that, uh... On that light, in that light. Sure, thank you. Um, so so uh, let's just talk about retirements therefore and then obviously the follow-on from a retirement is what happens to the aircraft if it's if it's parted out for spares or not. Um, and again actually in, in the last decade there were very few retirements. A asset utilization was very high, um, new aircraft deliveries were increasing but at the same time there were very few retirements. Obviously that's changing now and there's Dave was alluding to uh, a whole bunch of older aeroplanes. What effectively happens in, during this event is it's, it creates a swathe of early retirements, both of aircraft and in turn, where possible, uh -huh. aircraft types. And I'm picking Delta, as a, Delta as, a, as a good example of that. If you focus on aircraft size, um, I would say that uh, clearly, what looked like a big aeroplane before looks to airline fleet planning folks now like an even bigger aircraft because they have to fill it, stating the obvious. And that makes the challenges for the larger wide bodies. And I would sort of say 777, 300 and up in size, therefore all versions of 747, the A380. I think the, the entry into service for the 777X will be quite challenging, although that's, that's some years down the road. So. Wide bodies particularly tough um, because, of course, they're big and you need the traffic to, to fill them. And then the second point with wide bodies, of course, is that if it's an aeroplane which has been parked because it's, say, a leased aeroplane and it's either at the end of the lease or the lessee is not in a position to fly the aircraft again, wow, the reconfiguration costs of wide bodies really put a big dent into that value proposition. So that's a lot, lot of older aeroplanes will not fly again. And actually some of the newer ones, particularly the large aircraft, I think gonna be quite difficult to get back into, into the market. Uh, Michael, any, any thoughts from your side? Uh, pretty much agree with, with Dave and Andy. Um, I think 
uh, conversions are going to be interesting. Um, well, some retirements. Um, I, uh, I live in Atlanta. I fly Delta. Well, I don't fly at all right now, but um, they recently uh, announced uh, the retirement of their 777s uh, as they bring in on uh, A350s. Um, Lufthansa recently um, announced uh, uh, conversions for the A380 to uh, the cargo. Um, how many of the wide bodies um, are going to get converted to cargo is going to be uh, interesting. Give a, a bit of a second life, um, uh, both to, to uh, spares and, and MRO. Um, I think it's also uh, the new generation, um, not RJs, the, the E2s and the, the A220 or the, the C-series, um, picking up some of the lower end classic uh, 3.7 and, and 320 um, uh, might uh, impact those uh, fleets a little bit faster. All right, sounds, uh, sounds good. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the A380 conversion, is there, is there enough demand to, uh, to support a conversion program? And certainly it looks like there's uh, plenty of feedstock up there. Uh, what's, what's your thought, Andy? You, you were involved with that program early on. Yeah, I've got a long history. My, I mean, I was involved with the uh, three when it was still the three XX from 1996. Actually, the first customer focus groups that uh, that we had at that time at uh, Airbus. So um, certainly have a lot lot of uh, time invested in in the A380. Well, let, let's just talk about freighter conversions. I think we need to differentiate, and I I may have misunderstood myself here, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think. The freighter conversion we're talking about right now is, is, is let's say, the simple conversion where you, you take a passenger plane and you take all the seats out, you load stuff through doors. And that's certainly what airlines on a variety of types are doing today, either with leaving the seats in or with taking the seats out. And I would differentiate that from a real significant freighter conversion that requires putting in at least a main deck cargo door and a palletized cargo loading system and a, and a strengthened floor at the same time. I'm, I'm not aware, but I may be wrong that there's a 380 going through that second phase. I think at the moment, what they're doing is going through the first phase, which is fundamentally a whole lot easier and is a lot cheaper. And generally speaking would be viewed as a temporary measure, but I must admit in the case of some of those 380s, it's perhaps difficult to envisage them going back into, back into the, the, the passenger role. And just a little shout out for the 380 program. Um, if you remember, the 380 itself was originally designed to be both a passenger and freighter aircraft. And in fact, the freighter aircraft was, was sold to FedEx and UPS and actually was in the process of being built uh, when that freighter program was canceled. What that means is, if in turn in the future, the idea is to do a real freight conversion, there's a lot of knowledge already in terms of the structural capabilities of the aircraft about what that freight conversion would, would actually look like. Yeah, I haven't got too much to add other than I think A380 is just going to be a tricky aeroplane to make a, into a freighter. I mean, the, the Lufthansa conversion at the moment, I believe, is, as Andy said, just a very simple one to allow them to carry effectively lightweight, large volumes of lightweight product, um, like all the PPE that's being moved around the world. Um, so it's really just a temporary activity. Um, I think the fact that you can't necessarily easily get large freight into it easily, like you can't lift up the nose, for example, um, obviously gives 747 an advantage, but you know, if somebody's got deep enough pockets and they want to do it, I'm sure they'll do it if there's sufficient demand. I think we're going to see other demand in that passenger freighter market to replace perhaps some of the older airframes that the FedExes and UPSs are running. Um, so, you know, we're going to have a, a surplus of 777s, for example, or 76s. And those at least have got existing packs to freighter, um, uh, programs that can be easily adopted. So, I, I, you know, it, it, we'll have to see. All right, sounds, uh, sounds good. 
Uh, changing the subject uh, a little bit, uh, we talked about uh, used serviceable parts, and it appears that with all these airplanes on the ground, there may be a lot of used serviceable parts, and that airlines may actually go and and cannibalize the fleets that are on the ground to uh, to take parts rather than order new ones from uh, from OEMs. Uh, what do you think the uh, that practice will be, and what's the impact on the uh, on the OEMs and, and suppliers? Will we be swimming in a in a sea of uh, used serviceable parts that uh, uh, that need to be that need to be uh, uh, basically used up before we can start production again? I mean, as an OEM supplier, obviously we hope not, because um, that's one of our biggest competitors on the sparing side of things. Um, I, I think it, it's it's going to be obviously challenging to everybody. I mean, at the moment, we're waiting for airlines to consume and burn through their existing inventories, whether that's on parked aeroplanes or on their uh, stock shelves at the moment. Um, and and the, the USM guys are seeing as much downturn as we are as an OEM in terms of spare sales. I think it will be very slow to come back. When it does start coming back, obviously, airlines have got to rebuild those burnt down inventories. Um, so they're obviously going to go to the market and get the best deal that they can. Um, there might be a bit of a fire sale at the front end. But I think what interests me in the longer term is what shape the fleets are as they come back and what age those aeroplanes are. Because that actually may preclude, in some respects, them um, getting new... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, having USM parts even available to service those aeroplanes, particularly on the engine side, because that's very, very much man uh, managed by the, the OEM engine suppliers. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, there's no easy answer, but it'll be interesting to see how that, that side of things comes back. But hopefully I'm not going to be drowning in that sea of USM. Andy, your thoughts? Yeah, not, not too much to add. I mean, it's probably not an area I, I know a great deal about. I, I would just say sort of generally um, the concept of cannibalization where you, you have two planes, one you need to fly and it needs a part, the other one is on the ground and you take the part and put it into that one. It's a very short-sighted approach. I mean, you're sort of cutting off one hand to, to service really because uh, ultimately you want both of those aeroplanes to be flying and certainly the owner of the aircraft Whoever that, whoever that might be, would not want to see their aircraft cannibalized. So while we have seen it in the past, I mean, it just strikes me, it's more in a scenario where an, air, an airline is in a sort of financial spiral dive and probably not going to recover from, and therefore has no access of any sort to the market other than by cannibalizing other aeroplanes, you know, folks like sort of Kingfisher spring to mind as an example. So that being the case, I, I actually don't, foresee it's going to be a sort of dramatic change uh, behavior in the future. So Dave should hopefully rest easy in that case. I, unfortunately, I think Dave is going to be swimming in USM. <laughs> um, spend a lot of time at, at um, airlines with big uh, third party AMRAs. Um, uh, you know, you'd look at what Delta has done with, with DMS, Delta Material Services. Uh, buying aircraft specifically to part them out uh, for the USM. Um, I, I will agree with, with Dave that the fleet mix coming out of this in, in uh, a couple of years will, uh, to some extent, uh, affect um, the, uh, the USM market, both on the engine um, as well as the, the rest of the aircraft. Um, but airlines have gotten really good at, or certain airlines, uh, especially the ones with, with um, material services and, and maintenance services, have gotten really good at uh, partying out, uh, financially profitably partying out aircraft. Um, and there's other uh, organizations that, that do this for, for uh, profit. Um, I think some of the potential impact is that's gonna put additional pressures on, on the tier three, tier four uh, OEMs. Part of the reason that I said, I think we're gonna see bankruptcies in, and uh, consolidation in, in some of the OEM, smaller OEM market uh, is exactly because of the uh, impact uh, from uh, USM due to the downturn. 
All right, uh, final question before we go to Q&A. So uh, uh, let's make it a positive one toward the end and thinking about the future. Uh, big data is uh, certainly coming uh, with, with some of the newer technology aircraft. We're seeing the, the newer technology aircraft maintained in the fleets. Uh, how key is, uh, is IT moving forward to the MRO business? Are there uh, certain economies of scale that you need to play in the game? And uh, does this provide an advantage to the, uh, to the OEMs uh, going forward? Uh, Mike, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, that's sort of uh, in my billy wick. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I hate some technology terms, digital, cloud, and big data, right? Uh, we've had those things for, for decades. Um, really, when it comes to the business, uh, capabilities around uh, predictive analytics, diagnostics, prognostics, um, uh, and ultimately autonomics uh, are capabilities that have technologically advanced uh, quicker than the business. And what I mean by that is um, if I have a maintenance program, which is uh, time-based, or condition-based, uh, the program itself does not allow for predictive-based maintenance, right? Um, uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna see ex an, uh, an acceleration. You look what um, Airbus is doing with, with Skywise, um, a lot in partnership with both Air France and, and uh, Delta Airlines. Um, uh, all of the uh, engine OEMs have had advanced analytic capabilities uh, underpinning their business model of uh, performance-based logistics or, or power by the hour, what generically is, is called servitization. Um, so, you know, I, I said everything's not uh, negative. We're going to uh, some, there's going to be some very painful uh, positive come, come out of the, the, this downturn. I think a lot of that will be the advancement of maintenance programs uh, combined with these new technologies that are readily available, um, fairly easily implementable, uh, and the combination of technology, uh, maintenance programs, and new business models uh, is what will uh, make the industry stronger. Thank you. Andy, any thoughts on... Thanks, Ernie. So, so if you permit me, I'm going to I'm going to pretend I'm French for a minute, and uh, I'm actually going to answer the question that I would have preferred you to ask me, uh, as opposed to the one that you did ask me, because um, I haven't got a clue about big data. So, not not going to go there. I think there's an important topic we haven't touched on yet, and I'd just like to throw it in before we get to the Q and A, and it's it relates to the retirement decision. We've we've talked about retirements in general terms. Um, we've talked about spare parts. My comment on cannibalization is related to an, an, an otherwise serviceable aeroplane being cannibalized as opposed to the retirement of an aircraft uh, after which presumably it would be parted out. And, and the point I wanted to emphasize is that primarily that's an aircraft owner's decision as opposed to an aircraft owner's decision. And let's not forget that the lessors own roughly close to 50% of the in-service aircraft today. So for all of those lessor owned aircraft on the ground at the moment, of course, of course, of course, their primary objective is to see those aeroplanes flying again for the lessee. I mean, that everybody wants that actually. But where that is not possible, the lessor then has a decision to make and it's purely a financial decision. And it's nothing to do with the aircraft age other than the maths. And it's a question of what's the best revenue generating stream that I can get from this asset in, in the future. And as part of that equation, they would also, and this is the link to MROs, they would also look at what, if any, things like maintenance reserves that they have, cash in hand that they have against that aircraft. And there is a scenario out there where for surprisingly young aeroplanes, the lessor looks at a completely unknown revenue stream if they were to try and put the aeroplane to another airline and probably have to consume most of those maintenance reserves to get the aircraft back, to put the engines through the shop, et cetera, et cetera. Do they do that? Or do they take an early exit, um, hit, the, hit the exit early, retire the aeroplane, part it out, 
give the parts to Dave and recoup or retain in effect a significant portion of those same cash reserves. You, you're going to see some what would otherwise appear to be strange decisions with relatively young aircraft, in particular wide bodies, being retired and parted out through, through this event. And it's an aircraft owner issue as opposed to an aircraft operator issue. That's it. Thanks. Dave, your, uh, your thoughts? Well, I kind of got two things there. I agree with Andy. I, I think there's, there's multiple choices dependent on the ownership of the aeroplanes. A lot of the older legacy aeroplanes are in fact owned by the airlines themselves. A lot of the newer planes, um, including those things like NGs and A320s, are owned by the lease companies and their decisions are purely on a financial basis. What's it going to cost us to go to a secondary lease versus what do we realize in cash terms um, if we, we scrap it now? Um, so yeah, that's going to build up a surplus of parts in the, in the, in the coming uh, months and years, depending on how quickly people can actually tear the airplanes down. Um, so you've got a rate capability there as well. Going back to the big data one, um, I, I think big data is a big misnomer. And I, for one of the reasons that Michael says, because everybody calls it different things, nobody actually really knows what big data actually is. There is a lot of data that comes off the airplanes already that is used by both airline operations and airline maintenance side and MROs. Um, we certainly use some of the data, obviously, that come off of flight controls and engine control boxes to determine what's gone wrong with them. Um, I think that stuff's all good stuff, but there's, there seems to be this other big marketing push for big data, big data, but nobody knows who actually actually even owns it and who can then actually utilize it. Obviously, the aeroplane OEMs and the engine OEMs want to use that data to work with the airlines then it's a question of what the price point is for them to share that new at big data application with the airline and what efficiency it brings to their new mro paradigm but it really only impacts the newer airplanes the older airplanes obviously are analog so they really don't fit into that big data category so maybe that accelerates their their exit to the scrapyard don't know Thanks for the option will be uh, so, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say um, 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 how um, barriers to collaboration get broken down, right? Um, uh, Dave mentioned uh, uh, we're not even sure who owns uh, uh, the data, right? Um, to some extent, uh, we do, right? Um, Owners of aircraft own uh, operational data. Operators of uh, operational data uh, own operational data. And OEMs who contract for it, which is most of the engine guys, uh, uh, own, uh, own a right to that operational data. But there has been this big, huge food fight over the past two decades over <laughs> who owns the data, what technology do I use? Everybody wants to uh, make things proprietary, so it only works with my aircraft or my engine or um, the airlines, uh, MROs are a little bit more uh, open and collaborative. Uh, uh, Lufthansa has, has uh, been a big proponent of, of airline collaboration around uh, advanced analytics. Uh, when OEMs customers and MROs customers are in the condition that they are in now, I think you're gonna see um, an enlightened uh, and hopefully new um, approach to collaboration around uh, information technologies uh, and physical technologies that add value to the asset uh, and the operation. So um, uh, again, uh, nobody would want uh, the current economic situation to be the impetus of uh, collaborating uh, better across the industry, um, but I do think it will be an influencing factor on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Edison, if you're uh, back, can you handle the, uh, the Q&A? I can try. All right. Sorry about that. My internet collapsed and uh, has just come back 40 minutes later. I apologize. I don't know where anybody is. I don't know what, where the Q&A is. 
if you can tell me where we are, we can, we can, I can't hear you, Ernie. Uh, if you can go to the chat box, uh, we'll have some audience questions. And please, uh, those of you in the audience, uh, submit your questions to the chat box, and we'll uh, we'll address them to the uh, to the panelists. Okay, we have a question from David Bettenhausen. How will MRO spending on information and the operational technology be impacted? What will this look like in the short term versus medium versus long term? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? That definitely not an area of my expertise. I'm, I'm sure in the near term, so any spending is going to be um, minimal. But in the long term, I think it, it's we're trending towards that kind of activity. So it's it's kind of inevitable. Certainly with the newer aeroplanes. Mike, Mike's probably got much better experience than I have. Spending on uh, uh, IT and OT, um, well, it's interesting. Uh, Delta a couple of year, uh, years ago um, increased their uh, IT capex three uh, x. Um, uh, all of the OEMs uh, have been spending uh, inordinate amounts of money on uh, advanced analytics. Uh, when you talk about MROs, you got to be careful about which MROs you're talking about, right? Um, uh, Third-party airframe MROs who, you know, run three to five percent net profitable margins are the the lowest spenders upon uh, uh, in information technology. Um, they also, you know, potentially unless they change their business model, have some of the the lowest. Uh, demands for, for advanced analytics. They're not in, if you're not in the engineering business, you're not in the perfecting the maintenance business, maintenance program management business. Um, you're not in, uh, in operational maintenance. Your information technology uh, demand and therefore investment capex is, is fairly low. So when we talk about uh, MRO investment in IT, it really depends upon which part of the MRO uh, market you are in. Maybe just to add, a, it's more of a generic comment, but I think today, whether you're the CFO at an MRO, an airline, you know, or for that matter, an OEM or a lessor, you're sort of in a similar position, which is, it's uh, how do I not spend money? So CapEx Cash is king. zero and discretionary spending if there has been cut back and uh, dramatically. So I totally understand the concept of there are certain times when it's actually Actually most efficient to spend money and, and even this might be one of them but the ability to actually do that right now I would think for the next year to two years must be very limited question from uh, um, Ken Schwartz what is the impact going to be on smaller regional turboprops and regional jets um, shall I kick off there um, <laughs> off, off, the, off the cuff a little bit it. Um, so you've got good news and bad news. I mean, having a small aircraft is not a bad place to be um, when you have uncertain demand in the future. Um, however, a lot of those aeroplanes are with some of the smaller and financially weakest uh, airlines today, um, outside of sort of major airline regional network networks, that is. So I think they will, again, struggle with the, the older aeroplanes uh, dramatically. Um, on, on the other hand, and it was a comment that one of the panelists made earlier on, if you just go up, up in size a little bit, I think Airbus is probably feeling quite good at the moment about the prospects for the A220. I think Embraer, notwithstanding the issues with, with, with Boeing, probably feeling quite good about the longer term prospects for the for the E2. So I think it's less, the problems today is less to do with anything related to the aircraft requirement disappearing. I think it's still there. It's more related to the financial health or, or lack thereof of the operators. Yeah, completely agree with you, Andy. I don't think I've got anything to add. Mm. Question from um, Yishai. Did I miss mention of the maintenance activities to keep the aircraft in storage? and the subsequent RO operations needed to bring it back to operational status. If not, 
can you all comment on that new on those new opportunities i guess so i was working at a uh, uh one of the largest regional airlines um a while back and um who got into a little trouble when they put some aircraft um smaller aircraft into uh storage and weren't doing all the maintenance required um the the impact of the pandemic was was uh extremely fast and i don't think a lot of airlines were making decisions on parking them someplace or versus putting them into storage um, those decisions um are are taking place either right now or have started to take place over the past months um, which aircraft to put in storage there's layup maintenance there's obviously maintenance uh, in storage, and then there's return to service maintenance. Um, you know, some airlines actually have a bit of, uh, at least in North America or around the world, have a bit of experience with this uh, on the Max, right? Especially uh, Southwest and, and American Airlines. They've actually had to put a good number of aircraft uh, into layup maintenance um, uh, over the past year and a half, uh, as well as Boeing itself. Um, uh, so there is an, uh, uh, an economic impact to doing that. The expectation is obviously anything I put in storage, anything I, I just park, I expect to bring back online sometime in, in uh, less than six months. Anything uh, that I put in storage is something that I still expect to bring back sometime in the next year, right? Um, uh, it'll be interesting for third-party maintainers, you know, um, uh, my understanding Southwest and, and uh, American were using their own internal labor for their, uh, for putting those aircraft up uh, into, into uh, layup maintenance. Um, it'll be interesting if there's a little bit of a boom to the third-party MRO market from the vast number of, of aircraft that uh, could be in, uh, put up into storage. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll go next. The, the, the good news is it's very predictable. There shouldn't really be any surprises. I mean, the MPD is pretty specific about what the task requirements are for an aircraft, which is either parked in the short term or in storage in the long term. So I think the key element for the, for the airline in this case is to be aware of uh, what they're doing um, and not end up in a situation where you park an aircraft and sort of forget about it for, for a year. Then you have a lot of um, so as long as the as long as the tasks are, are done correctly, it's a very predictable scenario. It is true, however, that the longer the aircraft is in storage, um, the more the, lo the longer it takes, and the more expensive it is to to bring it back to service. And there is a cost to that. So I would not underestimate. In fact, I think we probably are underestimating. Everyone says, and it's true, the recovery is going to help, and that's of course the case. But I would not underestimate the airline related costs of being able to execute that uh, that recovery in a variety of ways you know i mean there's a lot of airplanes there to return to service and they've got to be picky about which ones they want um i think uh, uh, there's a couple of examples that i think southwest and ryanair have been quite clever in they're effectively keeping a larger fleet operational by effectively swapping them out regularly so they could keep all their regular maintenance checks um, as if they were aeroplanes in service. Um, so they're keeping all their balls in the air. So when they do come back, they actually can bring a larger fleet back to service relatively quickly and painlessly because the aeroplanes actually haven't been parked up for a long term. But I agree with Mike and Andy. I mean, the AMMs and everything's out there. So, it, you know, as long as you pay your bills for the parked aeroplane and you've got crews going out to them to do that regular seven day, 14 day, whatever maintenance periods there are in the AMM, um, it's very predictable what you've got to do and how much it's going to cost you. But you've got to keep paying your parking fees, otherwise you're kind of hosed. <laughs> That's all the questions we have, eh? All right, that's uh, fine. We'll do our, our little commercial uh, for Air Insight. How can, uh, how can we help you? you know, we, uh, we have uh, both consulting and our media. Obviously, we're doing a lot of work these days in strategies for risk mitigation and positioning for the recovery. 
uh, market research and competitive intelligence, finding out what's, uh, what's going on competitively in an environment that's uh, very uncertain. Independent forecasting and market projections, data models and analysis, our, our culture and coaching practice. Uh, we've got a lot of things that we can do to help uh, various individuals and uh, invite you to contact us for a no obligation discussion. Uh, next week, our webinar will be focused on Boeing and uh, we'll, we're gonna do it with uh, the Air Insight team. So I'll be on with uh, Addison and Michelle Merlizzo to discuss the current situation at Boeing, the restart of the 737 MAX production, and provide our outlook on Boeing's future and uh, competitive position as we, we emerge from this, from this pandemic, or hopefully emerge from this pandemic. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for, uh, for an invitation for next week's webinar, which you'll probably get uh, later on today or tomorrow. And uh, I wanna thank our, our panelists once again for a, uh, for a great job today. Uh, Michael, Andy, uh, Dave, thank you so much for participating with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in uh, future webinars. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Stay safe.